in northern eastern Europe through a process of creative interaction with the surrounding religion and culture. For example, Copernic and Krakow saw an explosion of Jewish interest in issues of astronomy, which, though largely conservative, culminated David Gantz's astronomical writings and his meeting with Kepler and Brahe in their observatory. Jewish legal codifications, such as those of Moshe Isseli's and Shlomo Lurir, paralleled the wave of noble interest in the sources of Polish law in the execution of the laws movement. The rabbinate took on many of the characteristics of honorary posts, religious and secular, held by the Polish nobility, eventually becoming in many cases little more than a benefice. Wooden synagogue architecture, particularly in Ukraine, adopted the local vernacular building style. And there are some signs that the aesthetics of the internal decoration in both wooden synagogues and churches may have had more in common than was previously thought. Finally, the nascent Hasidic movement seems to have adopted various organizational structures and practices from what they could observe in the monasteries and great noble estates. This thoroughgoing colonization of Judaism in Eastern Europe was, however, marked by one extremely important characteristic. It was almost never acknowledged. The historian searches in vain for contemporary descriptions of meetings or cultural contacts which would explain the parallel developments. They are simply not forthcoming. In fact, perhaps apart from a short period of interest in the Hebrew language in the early 16th century, both the Polish Lithuanian Jews themselves and following them generations of historians felt that they were living in cultural isolation from their surroundings. But if that was the case, how can we account for these clear parallel developments and the polarization of Judaism? In today's short paper, I should like to present one possible model of Jewish non-Jewish cultural contacts in early modern Eastern Europe, which may go some way towards giving at least a partial answer to this question. My goal, highly fitting for a conference on cultural archaeology, will be to try to identify those cultural contacts which did not leave the kind of clear evidence in the texts which intellectual historians are accustomed to use in order to trace lines of contact and influence. My immediate focus will not be what is often called popular culture, but something usually ascribed to the realm of intellectual culture, historiography. At the heart of the discussion will be those chronicles, Jewish and Polish, written during and after the Chmielinski uprising of 1648. As is well known, this rebellion started as an expression of discontent among the Cossack forces which guarded Poland-Lithuania's southeastern border. Once it gathered momentum following Chmielinski's success in drawing the Tatar armies into the conflict and the sudden death of the Polish king, the rebellion turned into a massive popular uprising. The main targets were the Catholic Poles, particularly the nobility who had driven the colonization of Ukraine, and the Jews who had acted as their agents and supported the colonization process over the previous two generations. The contemporary Jewish chronicles, however, paid little or no attention to the broader geopolitical, religious and ethnic factors in play in the uprising, usually portraying it as little more than a series of brutal and murderous attacks on the Jews. As a result, these texts were replete with stories of Jewish suffering and martyrdom. In recent years, work on the most important of these chronicles, Yavei Metzula by Nata Note Hanover, published in Venice 1653, has demonstrated that many of his stories of death, destruction and martyrdom seem to have been literary constructs more than factual reportage. Ted Fram has analyzed Hanover's tale of martyrdom in Tulchin and shown how it reworked stories of events which took place elsewhere in order to make a point about the nature of martyrdom during the uprising. And in my own work, I have also tried to identify other of this chronicle's narrative strategies. Today, I want to look at two of the more literary stories of martyrdom given by Hanover in his chronicle. Those of Jewish maidens in Nemirov who took their own lives rather than be forced to marry Cossacks. And we come to the first of the extracts in the sources that I gave you. Um, I've given the original Hebrew and the translation by Mesh. 
Um, it happened there, i.e. in Nemirov, that a beautiful maiden of a renowned and wealthy family had been captured by a certain Cossack who forced her to be his wife. But before they cohabited, she told him with cunning that she possessed a certain magic and that no weapon could harm her. She said to him, if you do not believe me, just test me. Shoot at me with a gun and you will see that I am not harmed. The Cossack, her husband, in his simplicity, thought she was telling the truth. He shot at her with his gun and she fell and died for the sanctification of the name in martyr, as a martyr to avoid being defiled by him. Make God avenge her blood. That's the first story. The second story runs as follows. Another event ha occurred when a beautiful girl about to be married to a Cossack insisted that their marriage take place in a church which stood across the bridge. He granted her request and with timbrels and flutes, attired in festive garb, led her to her marriage. As soon as they came to the bridge, she jumped into the water and was drowned as a martyr for the sanctification of the name. May God avenge her blood. So these are the two stories at the heart of what I want to talk about today. The second of these stories was not Hanover's invention. It was picked up from a previous chronicle, Soka Itim, by Meir of Chibjeshin, published in Krakow 1650. And that is number two in your handout. And you'll see it's exactly the same story for us. So the first question we need to ask is, if this story appeared in the two, source, in two sources, should we perhaps regard it as true? It is, of course, impossible to determine this conclusively. But whether or not events of this nature actually happened, it appeared in the chronicle in story form. And it is as a story that I want to examine it. In its literary reworking, this story, the story of the girl who drowned herself rather than be forced to marry a Cossack, seems to have used motifs which recurred in ancient and medieval Jewish culture. In the Babylonian Talmud, tractate Gitin, page 57b, uh, which you have as number three in the handout, a story from a Baraita is given in which Jewish girls being carried off to a life of prostitution in Rome jump from the ship and drown themselves rather than succumb. The story is repeated in slightly different form in the medieval Jewish chronicle, Sefer HaKabbalah, and that's number four in the handout, where Rabbi Moshe's wife jumps off the ship and drowns herself rather than be ravished by a pirate. Interestingly, though the motif of the girls drowning themselves to preserve their virtue was common to all the retellings, the older Jewish stories were set, set the story on board ship and as part of the retelling involve a discussion of the religious consequences of suicide, while the 1648 versions took place on a riverbank and include no religious discussion. In fact, on closer examination, the two Jewish stories look remarkably close to what seems to be a Polish version of a very similar le legend. As Judith Kalik has noted, the story brought by Meir of Chibjeshin and Nathan Hanover had much in common with the famous legend of Wanda, Queen of Poland. According to this legend, which is various forms, Wanda was the daughter of Krak, founder of Krakow, who succeeded her father after one of her brothers murdered the other. When the German prince Riediger demanded her hand in marriage as the price for not invading Poland, she refused. Though she won the ensuing war, she then committed suicide by jumping into the Vistula, either as a self-sacrifice to her pagan gods, or as a stratagem to avoid any other kind of invasion, or possibly both. The Wanda story has medieval roots, appearing first in Kadwubek's Chronicle of the Polish Kings and Princes. It reached more or less its final form in the 13th century Chronica Wielkopolska, while in the 15th century the famous chronicler Jan Długosz reworked it extensively in his chronicle adding the element of Wanda's jumping into the Vistula from a bridge. The story has further history. In the Renaissance, it was picked up by Polish poets such as Jan Kochanowski, who, developed, who devoted one of his elegies to it, and by historians and chroniclers such as Maciej Strykowski, <coughs> whose texts were very widely read in the Commonwealth Eastern region. Now, Strykowski brings this story in a very short retelling without too much detail, but I brought that as number eight, uh, in, the, in your handout. So, whether consciously or otherwise, the stories, Chibjeshin's and Hanover's chronicles, have as much in common with the Polish legend 
as it did with the Talmudic tale and its medieval variants. And if that were the end of the story, it would remain just another tantalizing possibility of Polish-Jewish cultural contact. However, the story of the Jewish maiden drowning herself rather than marrying a Cossack had its own afterlife in the writings of the Polish chronicler Joachim Pastorius. Pastorius, who had lived in Wawin in the years preceding the uprising, wrote one of the first Polish chronicles of the events, Bellum Stitico Cossackicum, which was published in Gdansk, 1652. The king, Jan Kazimierz, gave him, gave him his patronage, making him a historian to the court. In later life, Pastorius became a teacher of history at the gymnasium, first in Elblank and then in Gdańsk. And in 1680 in Gdańsk, he published a longer and reworked history of the uprising entitled Historia Poloniae Plenioris Parfis Due. Now the differences between the two versions written by Pastorius are significant here. In the first, composed while events were still unfolding, Jews were not mentioned at all. However, by the time he came to write the second, Pastorius was aware of the Jewish factor in the uprising. And as part of his chronicle, he gave his own potted version of Polish Jewish history as an explanation why the Jews had become victims of the events. On the other hand, he devoted very little space to describing actual Jewish suffering. And he only brings one description of the way Jews suffered in the uprising, and that is number five in the handout. Now, it's a long text, so I'm not going to read it all. I'll just read the section which interests us here. It begins on the fifth line. Many of the Jews' women met death only after being dishonored. He's talking about what happened in Nemirov. A Cossack kept one of the better and more gracefully formed Jewish women alive and demanded that she marry him. She indicated her agreement and seemed, moreover, to want to convert to the Greek religion. On condition, however, that before she converted, she be allowed to pray to God once more according to the Hebrew rite. He agreed, but added the guard as she was going. The Hebrew woman made for the river, and there, having put the precepts of the Decalogue which she carried with her at the base of a tree, and I have no idea where that element came from, she threw herself into the water with a memorable contempt for life, which that woman did not want to preserve without preserving her religion and her chastity. To the best of my knowledge, this story, which is clearly an embellished, an embellished version of that which is tradition in Hanover, does not appear in any of the other Polish or Cossack chronicles of the 17th century. Sadly, Pastorius, like the Jewish chroniclers, did not mention its source. There is no evidence that he knew Hebrew, so it is unlikely that he read it in one of the Jewish chronicles. What seems more likely is that an oral version of the story recounted in Jewish society, was picked up and retold in an in embellished form in Polish, which was how it reached Pastorius. The source of its attraction for him and his readers, and the reason he chose to include it in his chronicle, was almost undoubtedly its similarity with the Wanda legend. And now to Hanover's other story, about a young Jewish maiden committing suicide rather than being ravished by a Cossack. This is the woman who tricked the Cossack into shooting her. Interestingly, this story too seems to have jumped the culture gap between Jews and non-Jews in the 17th century. The story of a maiden pricking her assailant into killing her by persuading him she had the magic amulet does not have roots in the Jewish tradition. On the other hand, it can be found in medieval and early modern Christian culture. It is the story of the minor 3rd century saint Euphrasia or Euphrosina of Nicomedia, and her saint day is January the 19th. In a, I, didn't, I haven't yet found a, a retelling of this in a, in a religious text from the early modern period. So all I have here is a, is a 19th century retelling. And it runs as follows. In the reign of Diocletian, Euphrasia, who was young and beautiful, was condemned to have her honor taken from her. She bribed a young man to save her from what she most dreaded, i.e. rape, by promising him a charm against wounds and injuries, which would render him invulnerable in battle. She offered to show him the efficacy of the ointment, and for this purpose rubbed her neck with it. Then she bade him draw his sword and strike with all his, with all his strength. He did so, and cut off her head at a single blow. So it's exactly the same story of tricking 
uh, somebody into making you a martyr. Uh, this story, which is a, um, a part of Christian hagiography, and to the best of my knowledge was um, part of the Minayal published by Metropolitan Macarius of Moscow in the mid-16th century, although I still have work to do on tracing that side of the story, it did not remain simply in church literature. The humanist intellectual, and by the way, a Jewish converso, Jean-Louis Vives, used it as an exemplum in his book the, the, uh, on the education of a Christian woman, published in Basel 1538. And that's number seven in the handout. The Renaissance poet Ludovico Ariosto also used it in one of the adventures in his epic poem Orlando Furioso, Ferrara 1532. And this is one of the ways it might have entered Polish culture, since that work was translated into Polish in 1566, though it was not published at that time. By the end of the 16th century, though, the story had definitely been adopted by Polish historiography. Once again, it was the chronicler Maciej Strykowski who did so. Strykowski, born in the mid-16th century, composed an enormously influential chronicle entitled Kronika Polska-Litewska Zmuczka i Wyszystkie Wuszy, Königsberg, 1582. It was highly popular amongst the Schlachter and according to Rogov, was widely read and influential in Ukraine too. I know there are lots of, lots of, kind of sections here, but I hope it'll hang together at the end. So the legend we're interested in is in the handout number six, okay, in Strykowski's Chronicle, and it's there, deals with the wars of the 14th century. So I'll read that section. This war, 1326, this war witnessed a memorable act of a certain nun who was captured by a Lithuanian, i.e. a pagan. When he wanted to take her by force, she asked him not to abuse her in that way, promising him in place of payment and ransom to teach him such a trick as would make him invulnerable to iron. This the Lithuanian was very eager to learn. So, he stretched, so she stretched out her neck to him, saying, if you do not believe me, first try with your sword on my neck. The Lithuanian was taken in, and then drawing his sword with one blow, he cut off her head. Here is proof, if proof was needed, that early modern chroniclers had no compunction in making use of stories which they had either read or heard elsewhere when they came to write their histories. In this sense, what Hanover did was absolutely no different from Strykowski. This was a good dramatic story which made exactly the point he was interested in, so he used it. The question remains, of course, as to Hanover's source for the story. And once again, it is impossible to tell for certain. These chronicles simply did not give us the sources they used. So had Hanover read Strykowski? Though this cannot be read out, this cannot be ruled out, Hanover did have a remarkable knowledge of Polish society. It does seem unlikely, particularly since there are no other parallels between Strykowski and Hanover. More likely would seem to be the assumption that Hanover had either heard the story from a non-Jew during his youth in, his youth in Zaswa, or a Ukrainian Jew had told it to him at some stage during his life. Either he or his source seems to have Judaized the tale, exchanging the Catholic nun for a virtuous Jewish maiden and the Lithuanian soldier for a Cossack in order to make it fit the context. But this too was not unusual. It was a commonplace for Jewish authors when adapting a Christian text, as did Eliyahu Bachor of Italy when he reworked the medieval Bevis of Hampton stories into his famous Yiddish epic poem, The Bova Book, to go through the text, replacing Christian symbols and motifs with Jewish ones. In transforming the story of the Christian martyr into the Jewish Mekadeshit Hashem, then Hanover was treading a familiar path in Jewish culture. So, by examining the literary history, or perhaps more accurately, the literary archaeology of these two stories, of Nathan Notis Hanover, 1648, we have succeeded in revealing a quite complex pattern of intercultural exchange. When Hanover came to describe the martyrdom of one Jewish girl in Yemirov who was shot, he reworked the Christian martyrological legend of St. Euphrasia, which we know was retold in Orthodox culture and in the Polish Commonwealth's eastern regions. Here, the Christian, the Christian story jumped the barrier into Jewish culture where it was Judaized to meet the sensibilities of its readers. And when Hanover came to describe the martyrdom of a Jewish girl who drowned in Nemirov, he did so in terms 
highly reminiscent of the Vanda story, which had also reached the eastern parts of the Commonwealth through, among others, the works of Maciej Skrupowski. Hanover's use of the Vanda motifs seems to have given the story some appeal to Polish listeners. So the story, now in its Jewish form, then recrossed the cultural border to find its place in Joachim Pastorius' Latin Chronicle. Since none of these early modern Eastern European chroniclers cited their sources, we remain in the dark as to precisely how the stories crossed between the cultures. Though the fact that both stories may be found in Strykowski's writing is undoubtedly suggestive, there is no evidence that Hanover, or Szczepczesin for that matter, had, or even could, read his work. There is equally no evidence that Pastorius had, or even could, read the Hebrew texts. That being so, perhaps the best hypothesis to explain these cross-cultural phenomena is to argue that they were orally transmitted. In this way of understanding the process, the stories of Wanda and various Christian martyrs were told orally in Polish and Ukrainian culture from where they were picked up by Jews who were able to understand them and then retold in Jewish society. Once the Jewish chroniclers, and in particular Hanover, came to write their texts, the motifs and stories were already at hand as part of what they understood as Jewish culture. All they had to do was to rework them slightly. This would seem to suggest a different model of cross-cultural contacts from that we are used to. Direct intellectual contacts, such as those we know from Renaissance Italy and early modern Central Europe between Jews and non-Jews on an intellectual and high cultural level, do not seem to have taken place. There are also none of the usual citations of sources we are familiar with when written texts were read and used in historical writing. Instead, contact between early modern Jewish and Slavic intellectuals may not have been direct, but rather mediated by oral culture. Thus, it was only when these phenomena found their way into popular culture, where they were widely discussed and retold, that they had a chance of crossing the cultural borders between Jews and non-Jews. For while there is a significant dearth of sources indicating intellectual contacts, we do have a wide range of sources attesting to spoken contacts between Jews and non-Jews in early modern Eastern Europe. Such conversations could take place in the tavern or the market square, in the home where non-Jews were employed as servants and nannies, or even in the synagogue where Christians were employed as Shabbos boys. Though full literacy in Slavic languages was rare in Jewish society, very many Jews were able to speak Polish or Ruthenian fluently enough to have quite complex discussions with their Christian neighbours. In fact, there was no real barrier for spoken ideas crossing and recrossing between Jewish and Slavic cultures. So here, finally, we may have found a cultural mechanism which can explain both the existence of a wide range of Polish-Jewish cross-cultural phenomena and the reticence of the written sources to acknowledge them. Since the contacts took place on the popular and oral level, the intellectual elite authors simply did not feel the need to mention them at all. If that was indeed the case, it would only be through the kind of textual archaeology that I've tried to practice here that we will obtain a clearer and more detailed picture of how pre-modern cross-cultural contacts between Jews and non-Jews in Eastern Europe worked. Through, though the model of bottom-up contacts I have suggested remains just a hypothesis at present, it is to be hoped that future research of this kind will continue to shed new light on the hitherto hidden but nonetheless highly complex web of cultural contacts between Jews and Slavs in the early modern period. Thank you very much. Questions? Opinions? very rewarding uh, and we can connect uh, your methodology to what, have been, uh, what has been done in uh, two previous panels how we discussed different uh, in fact we discussed history of traditions on the material of apocrypha material of early Jewish material that preserved in the Islamic material and here you suggest to discuss history of motifs, history of traditions uh, on the basis of early modern early modern material, and here uh, the question of methodology, of methodologies arises, and whether the uh, 
methodology. Whether we use the same methodology or methodologies are different when applied in different periods, uh, which is very interesting to compare. Right. And I think that what normally we do is we think that uh, early materials uh, try to be very cautious in establishing uh, maybe we noticed genetic genetic connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you, you suggested here was genetic connection between Polish Polish uh, and, and Jewish tradition, which probably uh, very uh, which is convincing, yeah, which is very convincing because normally uh, more modern experience, the more material you have and you have proven more and better than Establish that there is a connection, genetic connection. Maybe too, too, many, too many cases where you have very specific features for traditions, very specific and unique, let's say, in two cultures. You can say, aha, uh -huh, these are two very specific features, uh, this might be something, something genetic, something, some direct uh, contact, at least connection. Uh, or when these traditions are unique for these cultures, you don't find them in other cultures. Uh, if this is the question is if this is the case, for example, if you compare yourself with Ariosto, you say find almost the same motif in Ariosto. Right. Uh, but you explain Poles read Ariosto, Jews talk to Poles, and this uh, this way you trace the tradition. Maybe it's more universal, maybe this tradition belongs to Czech more European, ancient and medieval authors. You can find this tradition in other sources, in addition to Ariosto, because uh, I, I don't know, I just suggest to check asking. Done that because the, if, you, if you put this motif very generally, like a uh, woman preferring being dead rather than uh, violated, goes back to Titus Livius, yeah, Russia, yeah. and Russia. Uh, yeah. no, Obviously, <coughs> there's a very, there's a very um, uh, fine line to be drawn between overgeneralizing, and the more you generalize the, the stories, the less this is going to work. So I, I was looking for two very particular, very particular aspects of a story, um, which one which was a woman drowning herself rather than being violated, and the other one specific features, specific features, and the other one was the, which was even more specific was this idea of the trick, of tricking your uh, the, the potential rapist to kill you uh, through some kind of amulet, and, it, and it, you have to be at that level, okay. I mean, the difference between what I was doing and a lot of what I've heard is I'm not doing any theological work here. I'm not suggesting that there is a textual transmission from one to the other. Quite the reverse, I'm suggesting that there isn't a textual transmission. And what we have to do is try to reconstruct some kind of context which uh, it, it negates the need to spend our whole time trying to find that, because I don't think it exists. My sense is that, that those contexts can actually take place. Please. You don't mention having consulted any of the folktale indexes. Uh, this does sound very much like uh, yeah, I have, folktale I have, yeah. terms. I, in general terms, it is. In specific terms, it is. So this <coughs> idea of the trick, I mean, a woman drowning herself to avoid is something which can be, can be, it can be found in the, in the folk motifs. The idea of this trick, the, the amulet trick, I didn't find. So that is, that, that is something that's different. What was interesting about the woman drowning herself was that I didn't need to suggest it was something general because it appeared in both Jewish and Polish tradition. Constantine, you want to ask? Yes. Ah, yeah, uh, just for the reason, there is a very big distinction. I don't know how it's from the Jewish point of view, but from the point of view of Christian markets, between tricking someone into killing you and committing suicide. Uh, they are very, very different things. Yeah. That is, for a for Christian market, you have to, it's, it's, it's the game for who to commit suicide. Otherwise, everyone has to commit suicide. For execution, in order to spare, in order to spare suffering, you cannot do that. You have to treat someone into killing you, or just jumping in the river. It's a sin of so In terms, in terms of the yeah, in terms, it's very different. No, the Christians. No, Christians. Was it true? No, the reverse. The Jews are commanded to commit suicide yeah. rather than to do that. Yeah. What? What was it? What was interesting there? Um, is that in the, in the previous Jewish chronicles of the, the previous major massacres during the First Crusade, the women were extremely active, not just in committing suicide, but in fact in helping their families commit, by murdering their children. Um, 
And this is, uh, so this is a departure from that ancient Jewish tradition in the direction of something uh, which I'm, we seem to have much in common with the Polish tradition. So I'm not trying to suggest that both stories were from church tradition. The Vanda story is not a church story. Euphrasia, Euphrosina, is clearly uh, a story with a church background. So, so it, I say it's, it's archaeology, okay? I'm working under the surface, I'm not working on this. Okay, we finish with that. Well, look, we already. It's, it's her time, she's already. Yes, it's my we time, already, so we already my time. Uh, okay, you want it? You yes? Go on. No, there are other contemporary no. oral scores, which is folk, Polish folk songs about uh, Polish uh, maidens that were married to Cossacks and committed suicide. And already Polish Merrick suggested that it influenced a uh, Yiddish folk song. On, uh, okay, the, that's a good source. I'll go back to So I little. think the missing link. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know Schmerrick's book. You want to tell us what you want? Just uh, add a bit, very, very brief uh, observation. I thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I, I congratulate you on this uh, great archaeological dig. It really works and works perfectly well. Uh, I will mention two things very briefly. Number one, Hanover himself is guilty in, uh, in, in what we right now see in historiography, this idea that there were no contacts between uh, intellectual Jewish elites and, and uh, Gentile elite. Remember at the end of, of uh, Yemen and Sula, he describes what actually Polish Jewish um, um, that Polish Jewry was before 1648. And he says they all were sitting on uh, their chairs reading Torah 24-6, and that's what it was all about. So he creates this image of non-can contacts. Right. And this image really has a major impact on Jewish historiography. We are still spitting it out. Yeah. So, so I believe it's, it's important to mention this. And, and in view of that, since you showed wonderfully that we are dealing here with a literal resource, rather than that with a historical source. Still, it's important, I, I urge you to make the next step and ask yourself the question, where is the historicity in Hanover's crime? Maybe its historicity is not in the story, but in the way the story links itself to these uh, 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 contextual stories that the you Hanover's use. story is, uh, I'll be very quick, Hanover's yeah. story is undoubtedly literary retelling. It is also history. I've worked on the history of his story about the siege of Lvov, uh, in, uh, in comparison with uh, Kushevich's chronicle, and it's absolutely remarkable, that apart from two very telling points where Hanover has a, an agenda, that the two actually go hand in hand, and that is very clearly a work of history rather than literature. The problem with a work like Hanover's is set pulling the two apart in a, in a, deep, in a gentle enough fashion so you can take the history and the literature and see them both interacting. That is very difficult. It's one of the things I've tried to do here, but it's not easy. Okay. Thank you. Now we come to the second uh, paper by uh, Judith, Dr. Judith Kalik. They are like Jews. Use of the Jews in Christian polemics in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 16th, 17th century. Please. <clears throat> the use of the Jews as archetypical heretics was an integral part of the common Christian polemic tradition going back to the fathers of the church. Because of the multinational and multi-religious composition of the Polish Ukrainian Commonwealth, thank you, political conflicts naturally took the form of religious polemics, since during the early modern age, Religion served as a central channel for expression not only of religious feelings, but also of national and political identity. For this reason, religious polemic, litu uh, <coughs> excuse me, religious polemic literature flourished in, the country, in, in this country to an unusual scope, especially before and after the Union of Brzesz in 1596, when the religious polemic for and against the Union of Withdrawn reached the point of exploring. Recently, Magda Tether has dedicated her book, Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, uh, to the place of Jews in the Polish Catholic anti-Protestant polemic after the Reformation. However, contrary to her claim, the equation of the Jews with heretics was by no means restricted to the Catholic Protestant polemic, 
That was typical for all sides, including the Orthodox, who also frequently used the Jews in their polemic against Catholics, Unions, Protestants, <coughs> and even Muslims. The present paper examines this Jewish angle of interconfessional Christian polemic in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Use of the Jews by various churches in their polemic against each other was not uniform. Orthodox and Union colonists were united in their defense of Eastern ritual practices against Roman Catholic Western Rite. These differences were partially derived from the interpretation of the Jewish halakha, and therefore the vivid discussion of purely Jewish halakhic matters was an integral part of this polemic. Especially important were two issues the nature of communion and the way of calculating the Eastern. In the first matter, the differences between the Eastern and the Western Rite go back to the, to the contradiction in the New Testament itself. According to the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, the Last Supper took place on Passover Eve. But according to the Gospel of John, Jesus Christ was, was crucified on Passover Eve, symbolizing the sacrificial lamb. Following the Synoptic Gospels, the Western Church believed that the bread proclaimed to be his body by Jesus during the Last Supper was in fact Jewish matzah, unleavened bread, or azimut bread. But the Eastern Church followed John's version and claimed that the bread which was used on that occasion and therefore should be used in communion ritual must be leavened bread, Hebrew chametz, Greek anzima. Since neither church was ready to admit the contradiction in the Holy Scripture, already in the <coughs> mid 11th century, on the eve of the Great Schism, Leo, Metropolitan of Ochrida, wrote a polemic tractat on the unleavened bread, where he claimed that the Last Supper of Synoptic Gospels also took place before the Passover, since according to Luke 22.8, Jesus sends Peter and John to Jerusalem in advance in order to purchase the sacrificial lamb, but according to the Mosaic law of Exodus 12.3, this should be done on the 10th of Nisan. <coughs> All polemists of the age of the Union of Jesh, both its opponents, such as Vasily of Ostrov, and its supporters, repeat this argument, and even as a special chapter of the Act of the Union was dedicated to this matter. Of course, the 11th century cleric was unaware that Mishnah defines this commandment as Passover of Egypt, Pesach Mitzrayim, as opposed to Passover of Generations, Pesach Dorot, practiced in the Second uh, Temple period, Sakim 9.5. Since the very existence of Mishnah and Talmud was discovered in, the, in Western Europe only in the mid-12th century, it is significant, however, that Orthodox and Union Ptolemists were still ignorant about this discovery by the end of the 16th century. Catholics found it necessary to stress in their response that according to the Jewish tradition itself, the unleavened bread, matzah, is regarded as bread, lechem. The Catholic view is beautifully expressed in 18th century sermons of Stanislav Bujkowski, who explained to his audience that the Jews call unleavened bread not only matzah, but also, also lechem oni, bread of poverty. The lechem oni appears in the text. Um, uh, since even the poor should be able to eat it on Passover 7, Bujkowski also explains what is a fikuman relying on Talmudic tract of Psachim, Maimonides, and Avarbanel? The, the central point of this learned discussion is, of course, to prove that the Last Supper was in fact the Jewish Seder Pesach. And for this reason, Jesus broke the bread and did not cut it with a knife, as the Orthodox do with their living prosper. The second point of the disagreement between the East and the West was the way of calculating of Easter Day. This controversy intensified with the Gregorian reform of 1582, when the date of vernal equinox was moved 13 days forward, according to the new calendar adopted by the Catholic Church, but rejected by the Orthodox. As a result, the Catholic Easter could sometimes coincide with the Jewish Passover, while the Orthodox Easter always led one week after the Passover. Therefore, the Orthodox and Uniate polemists alike claimed that the Roman Catholic transgressed the ruling of Nicaean Council of 325 that prohibited celebration of Christian Easter on 14th of Nisan. The Roman Catholics on their part claim that the Orthodox calculation of Easter Day is directly linked with the Jewish calendar 
which was also prohibited by the same Council of Nicaea. Some Catholic colonists claim that the Orthodox priest consulted their rabbi, rabbi, <coughs> excuse me, consulted the rabbis in order to determine their Easter date. Thus, young Brustius of Kozhul wrote in his first Apology of Roman Common Calendar, published in Krakow in 1641, and I quote, there was a case with the Russian priests and their hierarchs when they came to speak with the Jews about the Easter. As far as I understood, because they believed that the Jews calculate the time of the Pascha better than the Christians, end of quote. As we have seen, the Orthodox and Unions held the same position on these two matters uh, of the nature of the consecrated bread and Easter day. But the Jews promptly figure also in a bitter polemic between them uh, for, the, for and against the Union of Church. Like modern talkbacks, this polemic was conducted by several persons with false identities. A Calvinist must the Orthodox, Greek disguised as Lutheran. In 1597, the book entitled Apocrisis Answer appeared in Vilna, first in Polish and then in Lutheran. Its author called himself Christopher Philalethes, friend of truth, in Greek. This was an Orthodox answer to a book written by the famous Polish preacher Piotr Skarga in favor of the Union of Church. A Uniate response appeared already in 1599, also under a pen name of Philotheos, friend of God, entitled Antirisis, <coughs> counter response. Its author was Peter Arcudius, a Greek uh, convert to Catholicism and a Jesuit. Since he knew neither Polish nor Ruthenian, he wrote his tractat in Latin, and it was translated into Polish and Ruthenian by Hippotipoti, the future Union Metropolitan of Kiev. Already Arcudius claimed that the author of Apocrisy was a, in fact a Calvinist pretending to be Orthodox, but he did not disclose his name. Only in 1781, Polish writer Ignacy Stabilski identified the author of Apocrisy as Christopher Bronski, a Calvinist member of literary circle of Prince Constantine of Austria. Constantine of Austria. But, a Polish scholar, Józef Trejda, proposed in, in uh, 1912 to identify his, him as Marcin Broniewski, famous communist writer from Prague. In any case, the Protestant, especially Calvinist influence, is conspicuous in this composition. Such an unlikely Calvinist Orthodox cooperation against the Union of Czech became possible because of the common interest of, region, <coughs> of religious minorities to preserve the famous religious tolerance of the 16th century Commonwealth, crumbling under attacks of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Calvinist and Orthodox nobles even formed a common confederation in Vilna in 1599. This cooperation was, however, an, an easy one for both sides. And for this reason, the colonists of this age disguised their, uh, <coughs> excuse me, decided to hide their true identity. Jews are mentioned in apocryphies in a context typical for the Protestant religious claim. Thus, speaking about the uh, Council of Trent, which proclaimed uh, the beginning of the Catholic Counter Reformation, Philaletus says, and I quote, non one, not, one, not one Jew is hidden behind those statues. Ni adin sejit the kukwalach krit. The rhyme exists only in Ukraine. In Polish, ni jeden sejit the kukwalach drzewie. Of course. This puts in question the original language of this, of this composition. He also quotes in free rephrasing the Babylonian Talmud, and I quote, simple Jews are not allowed to argue in complicated matters with the Gentiles. They can only answer, we do not understand in these matters. Only our rabbis can answer you, and I quote. The argument is purely Protestant one, since the author opposes the idea of the intermediate position of the priest which he attributes to the, uh, also to the Jews. This, not, this does not make sense for the Orthodox polemic against the union of withdrawal, since the position of the Orthodox and the Catholics in this question were identical. The attribution of this typical uh, Protestant argument to the Orthodox became possible only in the specific circumstances of the union of church, where the majority of Orthodox hierarchs, including all bishops and many priests, accepted the union while the lay Orthodox Brotherhood remained the only firm guardians of the true faith. These Brotherhoods, to a certain extent, could be presented as Orthodox correspondence 
to the idealized Protestant communities of believers. The use of the Talmud for Christian propaganda is not less problematic. As we have seen, Talmud remained practically unknown for the Orthodox polemists, but it was widely used by Catholics and especially Protestant writers. The paraphrase passage that was mentioned is taken from Babylon's uh, uh, Sanhedrin, page uh, 38. Said Rabbi Nachman, who is able to answer to the Minim in Christians, as Rabbi did, let him answer. But who is not, let him not answer. Quote. The passage about the angel Metatron follows as an example of such a difficult question. Metatron is often presented in the Jewish Christian polemic as a Jewish parallel to a figure of God and the Son, one of the components of the Christian uh, <laughs> Holy Trinity. This was, in fact, the reason why precisely this Talmudic passage was translated into the Latin in the so-called Paris Files, a collection of Talmudic passages translated for the famous Paris trial of Talmud in 1242. This, this translation was used also by Raymond Martin or Raymondus Martini in his Cubio Fidei, Dagger of Faith, from which it found its way to numerous polemic compositions, including our apocryphs. However, Dagger of Faith remained unknown in the Orthodox list, and no quotation from it is attested in any Orthodox polemic composition, at least not prior to the 17th century. Jews are mentioned also in the anti -resist. Surprisingly, if its author was a foreigner, in a typical Polish context. According to the, to, to the tractate, according to this tractate, the Orthodox, claim, the Orthodox claim that the Catholic priests, just as the Jews, serve as agents of Polish landlords, landlords in Ruthenian villages. The author refutes this claim, confirming that the Jews really serve in this capacity, but the comparison of them with the Catholic priest is utterly false. The argument reflects, of course, the realities of the Polish colonization of Ukraine, when the Jewish leaseholders of Polish magnates often serve as a sole representative of the landlord in the village. Their alleged equation with the Catholic priest is uh, an interesting one. It probably means that the Polish priests were seen in the eyes of Ukrainian peasants as a spiritual herald of the expansion of the forward system and peasants in Serbia. At this point of equation between Catholic priests and the Jews, Protestants also express similar view. And I quote, uh, excuse me. The famous Polish Calvinist poet, Nikolai Ray, wrote in his poem Zwerchad, Romeo, that, and I quote, red cheek and fat Catholic monks are more similar to the Jews than to our brothers with swollen, swallowed eyes and pale faces, end of quote. Another matter of controversy between the Orthodox and the Unions, which involved the Jews, was the Orthodox claim that the Pope is the Antichrist. The concluding chapter of the Act of the Union is dedicated to this curious idea. The Unions used a simple syllogism. If the Antichrist is the Messiah expect <coughs> expected by the Jews, and the Jews do not believe that the Pope is their Messiah, the Pope could not possibly be the Antichrist. And I quote from the Union from the act of the year. Also, there is a true sign of coming of the Antichrist, that the Jews will accept the Antichrist as their Messiah. And thus, if the Jews have to accept this true Antichrist as Messiah, show me any pope whom the Jews accepted as their Messiah. Then, it is true also that this Antichrist should be for, uh, born from the Jewish people, as said Jerome clearly writes, since the Jews will always believe and claim still now that the Messiah will come from their own people, they would never accept an alien as their messiah. But this is true that no pope, no pope ever was born from the Jews, end of quote. And indeed, several decades later, as if in a fulfillment of the Uniate prophet, of the, uh, Uniate's prophecy, the Jewish messiah did appear in the person of Shabtai Tzvi. The special place of the Jewish messiah in the Orthodox Union plan became probably the main reason for special attention given by the Orthodox side to such internal Jewish matters as the Sabbatian movement. In 1668, only three years after the conversion of Shaktai Tzvi to Islam, Ioannitsa Oshgawatovsky published in Kiev in Ruthenian language his book dedicated to the anti-Jewish religious polemic. This was one of the rare examples of Orthodox composition of this time. 
Though written under strong Catholic influence, the autopsy's books stand in sharp contrast to a total lack of interest in the Sabbatian movement displayed by Catholics and Union contemporary writers. His interest in this affair was probably triggered by the need to prove that the Jews themselves rejected Shabtai Tzvi as Messiah. The conversion of Shabtai Tzvi to Islam was also of a great interest, interest for Galatovsky, who published a few years later, in 1683, another book dedicated to the anti-Islamic polemic, Al-Quran Magamiyatif, and so on and so forth, where he claimed that the mother of Muhammad was Jewish, and this explains the Jewish influence on Islam. We have seen <coughs> that the Orthodox Protestant cooperation against the Union of Jesh was an exceptional phenomenon. Normally, Catholics, Unions, and Orthodox colonies held practically identical position in their anti-Protestant claim. The pioneer of the Orthodox anti-Protestant polemic was Artemi the Elder, Stavets Artemi, a rather picturesque figure of Moscovite origin. In 1554, he was accused in some heresy, condemned by the 100 chapters council, Staglava Sabor, and impelled in the infamous Salafki monastery. Artemi fled from there and, then, uh, <coughs> and after many adventures reached the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, where he settled in Swords, as many other political refugees from Moscow. Then Artemi wrote several epistles, many directed against Protestants. Some of them were part of his correspondence with the famous Aryan poet Shimon Budu, who resided also in Swords at that time. As other anti-Protestant columnists, Artemi accused the Protestants in similarity to the Jews in several points. Their, pro, uh, their preference of uh, decalogue to the Gospels, their uh, iconoclastic views, their free interpretation of scripture, and so on. In the last point, Artemi accused Jan Hus and his followers in Judaizing position. It's not, it is not clear whether this reference to the ex extinct movement echoed the so-called Judaizers controversy in Moscow, or it possibly reflected the fact that some Bohemian brothers, spiritual remnants of the Hussite movement, found refuge in the eastern part of the Polish Lithuanian colony. Artemi called the Aryans uncircumcised Jews, and this radical anti-Trinitarian sect served also as favorable target of accusation in Judaizing by Catholics. Thus, the Italian Jesuit in Kalish, Alfonso Pisani, called them in 1587 simply new Jews. He also used the same expression as the Orthodox Artemi, uncircumcised Jews. Sunt in Polonia, Vetera, Setnovi, Judei, Sunt Enim, Quidam, Judei, Sine Circumcisione. There are in Poland all the new Jews. Some of them are uncircumcised Jews. Referring to the same Shimon Budli in his friends, another Jesuit, Mikołaj Czechowski, also frequently mentions Jews in his numerous polemic compositions against Aryans. In his composition, uh, me, uh, he writes that it is not surprising that the Jews and the Tur Turks spit upon the Christian faith and mock it, since they see how other Christians teach, for example, that the Holy Spirit, which appeared in the form of a dove, was in fact a light shadow illusion. He continues that many Jews converted to Christianity, and therefore there are so few Jews, but the Christians come closer to Judaism via Arianism. Arians themselves, according to Tchaikovsky, admit that many of them finally converted to Judaism which testifies about the similarity between them. They also prefer the company of Jews to that of other Christians, and their ministers of religion are more similar to Talmudic sages than to Christian priests. He also claims that no Jew ever uh, dared to write a book showing the error of Christianity, which proves the inferiority of their faith. However, there was one Jew, Jacob of Belgium, who wrote that the Aryans are so similar to Jews that they should circumcise their children and observe Shabbat. This Jew wrote his book as a response to the collection of uh, dialogues by Chekhovich the Aryan. Chekhovsky continues that Chekhovich answered to this uh, criticism, but he did this so unconvincingly that, Chekhovsky were, uh, that, that if Chekhovsky were a Jew, he would win this dispute easily. Marcin Chekhovich, mentioned by Chekhovsky, was a leading Aryan polemist. He claimed in one of his compositions, published in 1581, that he answers to a Jew called Jacob of Belgium, who wrote a polemic tractat directed against the earlier composition of Chekhovich, uh, his famous uh, Dialogi Chechiansky, in 1575. 
The reference of Tchaikovsky to this Jacob of Belgians is, of is very important, since the very existence of this person is unsure. In any case, it seems I, I, I'm finishing. I, okay. I don't have any time. Okay, you have In any case, it seems that both the Aryans and the Jews feel equally Catholic and Orthodox claims of their uh, of their identity. Um, on the other hand, the Kari columnist Sakov Trophy mentions in uh, mentions in a positive way Shimon Budni in his book Hisukemuna, the only anti-Christian polemic composition from the Jewish perspective ever written in the Polish Lithuanian canon. Catholic and Orthodox anti-Protestant polemics differed in, uh, at one point, their attitude towards the Jewish Kabbalah. The Orthodox Afanasi Filipovich wrote in his diary in 1646 that he saw in Krakow and Rakow many Jewish Kabbalistic books which should be forbidden in a Christian country. He refers uh, to Rakow, uh, his re uh, reference uh, excuse me, excuse me, to Rakow is of a particular interest since there was located the famous Aryan typography and theological academy until their expulsion from Poland in 1658. The matter is that, that the Protestant held in the 17th century a positive view about the Jewish Kabbalah, uh, seeing it as a link between Judaism and Christianity. The early Silesian pietist Christian Knorr von Rosenberg translated uh, in, uh, in the last quarter of the 17th century a large part of the Book of Zohar into Latin under a name Kabbalah de Nuda, unveiled Kabbalah, for the express purpose to use it as a tool for, for conver uh, conversion of the Jews uh, into Christianity. This work served as a scholarly basis for the massive use of Kabbalah in missionary activity among the Jews, German, uh, Jews in Germany and later in Poland. <coughs> And Catholics, uh, in contrast to the Orthodox, share this view with Protestants. Catholic Pietro Colonna Galatino expressed this view as early as 1516 in his book The Arcanis Catholica Veritas, written at the request of the, uh, of the Pope Leo X. In Poland, however, the interest of the Catholic clergy in the Kabbalah was triggered by the German Pietist mission among the Polish Jews. Only in the 18th century, such Polish preachers as Franciszek Antoni Kowielski and Jan Kuszakowski began to use the Book of Zohar and some other composition of the so-called Urianic Kabbalah, such as Pardes Srimonim, Moses Kordoveo, and Avodat Kodesh by Meir Gabay, in their ceremonies in synagogue, and to sum up. <coughs> Jews are often mentioned in Christian polemic literature not in the context of adversus Judeo's tradition, but as an example for comparison in the context of religious polemic of various Christian denominations against each other. It is interesting that different Christian uh, factions uh, entered uh, in the course of this polemic into rather unexpected alliances concerning this or, uh, or that aspect of Judaism. The unions and the Orthodox hold the same position in matters of nature of uh, the nature of uh, consecrated bread and the Easter calculation. Orthodox cooperated with Protestants against the union of bread. Catholics and unions were united against Orthodox claim that the Pope is the Antichrist. Catholics and Orthodox alike equated Aryans with the Jews, but Catholics and Protestants saw the Jewish Kabbalah in a positive way, while the Orthodox held the negative. Jews on their part mostly ignored this kind of polemic except for an attempt to distance themselves from the equation with the Aryans on the one hand, and the use of Aryan arguments in their polemic against the Catholics, uh, Catholic for the, Christi uh, for the um, uh, criticism of Christianity in general, on the other hand. Now the discussion, please. I think there was another argument um, for uh, the Orthodox to uh, associate Catholics and Jews. Uh, uh, Catholics and uh, uh, Jews were accused to have fast concepts. Jews to have fast concepts? Yes. To have fast concepts. Like Jews. The Aryans, you mean? The Aryans, you mean not Catholics? The Catholics. Were, uh, the Ah, uh, uh, yes, 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 yes,
Artem the Elder. Starit Artem. Yes. And another point I understand. Uh, how the new styles uh, uh, of the country is connected with um, the East, uh, the corporation of East. I think it's the, uh, the, these are two different things. Um, I mean, the corporation of East, uh, which uh, um, uh, can be based on, uh, only on the astronomical uh, factors, or, or also on the on the narrative, uh, on the narration we have, because um, that, uh, uh, the authors take in the, in, in the research also the, the, the narration. So it was after the, not after the, um, the Jewish Passover, uh, while well, uh, the new calendar. It influenced the Catholic Passover, it, uh, Pascha, yes? It influenced that sometimes it coincided with the... Uh, the well, yes, but, uh, I, don't, I don't know, and it's too difficult for me to explain how, uh, I don't know really how it uh, would happen, uh, but it did. I don't know, maybe. This is a phenomenon, yes. new style. And, uh, but I knew it, I know it influenced that, but uh, how exactly did it happen, it's too, uh, too difficult to explain or to okay. understand. <laughs> Yeah, uh, first of all, Jews, first, Jews and Catholic pastors, certainly, the famous passage on Sidonius, uh, uh, I think Julius Caesar said that he was hungry the entire day, but in fact, the Jews said that he, and uh, there was the same problem of interpretation. The interpretation is that by Saturday, Yom Kippur is man, because Yom Kippur is connection of the Shabbaton that can fall on Saturday. Maybe it's, this is this connection also for this case. And another point, uh, 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 thank you very much for, for the presentation. And it seems to me that in fact there are two groups of uh, cases. Your cases can be divided into two kinds of phenomena. One is like your title, they are like Jews, like when heretics are uh, created to Jews, and which is very uh, early attested phenomenon from the early history of the church, very common accusation in Judaism. Uh, and another issue, which to my mind is much more inter interesting, and should be divided into some separate study, Jews uh, are still relevant for Christian theology. The false people of Jews are still relevant for Christian theology, which seems fascinating, very interesting, and even actual. And nowadays, we have Protestant trends that still find Jews relevant for basic theological scenarios and so on. Okay, and, um, yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic, very good sort of structure to, to that whole very important topic. The one aspect that didn't come up is a negative aspect, which is why we don't see in Poland the kind of Protestant Jewish contact, discussions, learning Hebrew that we know so well from Germany. Even when they had the chair at the university, the Alien University, <coughs> almost you know there's one converted Jew because of the Hebrew for two years and that's it. They had some sense what what was going on, why it was all polemic and there was no problem. <coughs> I don't know, from the Protestant point of view, you know, this uh, Czechovich invented the, or didn't invent Jakob of Belgium, but he needed this Jew, you know, yeah, because, you know, uh, Tazbir claims that he did exist, Weintraub uh, claims that he didn't, yeah. you know, and yeah, so on. Yeah. I don't know. I think uh, you have suggested some path to, to, to this, because I think in Poland, what characterized Polish Jewry, especially in the Eastern parts, where most uh, Protestant sects were also, uh, well, in Poland, Crown Poland itself also, but mostly in the eastern part, um, is that the conflicts were on a very low level with, in the village, in the city. Uh, most of cultural contacts and uh, was on not on an intellectual, as you stress, level, but on a very day-to-day -day basis and with the uh, strata of society that didn't write. Yeah, exactly. With peasants, with the, you know... Uh, I wanted you to, to answer the question I was asking. That's yes, why, why yes, didn't it happen? I think, uh, but why? Because this is the character of uh, Polish Jewry, I think, of the Polish Jewry, especially in this part of the country, in the eastern yeah. part of the country. Uh, please, any, uh, any more questions? Moshe, no? Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, now the last paper for today, it is
by uh, Sergei Stemchinas uh, from Vilna, learning Hebrew in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Dutch, <laughs> and evidence from the 16th, 16th century Cyrillic manuscript. the first group, 
mainly Hebrew texts written in, in Cyrillic. Uh, and uh, I uh, presented them, all these fragments, on the first page of my, of my handout, along with uh, a transliteration of the original Hebrew text, which um, I prepared myself. So if you uh, notice some inaccuracies in it, uh, so please uh, tell me. Um, since uh, every critical comments uh, on the um, handout also in my report will be highly appreciated. <coughs> so uh, the first text, the last song, uh, has an original title in the manuscript. Psalom Posledni Nizmor Reksha Vostivanie. По числу еврейскому Мизмор 147, по греческому числу Псалом Рекши Песи 150. So we will comment this uh, difference in number uh, in a moment. But as the first step, I propose uh, to pronounce, uh, to try to read uh, this text written uh, in Cyrillic in order to to, to see how it might be written by an uh, Eastern Slavic scribe. But in anticipation of, of uh, what will be said uh, later, uh, I would like to indicate uh, at once that the Cyrillic letter um, uh, Glagoy should be pronounced uh, like R and not like G in this particular uh, in, 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 uh, so, uh, as a result, we will have uh, somehow distorted uh, pronunciation of the Hebrew original, but, any, uh, 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 but it is exactly the way uh, the um, original scribes uh, must have pronounced it. Hallelujah. Галу эль бехотшо, галу гу биркия узо, галу гу бигву роса, галу гу кров годно, галу гу бетека шопар, галу гу беневе вехино, галу гу бетов умахол, галу гу бемінім how do who doesn't slay? So now we have a gap, it's uh, obviously co caused by Omeo Telefto, because a uh, poor, small portion of text uh, has been skipped uh, uh, between the two identical um, uh, forms of the same word. Truya, Kol Ganshama. So, then you have two incomplete uh, uh, verses from the Song of Songs, just several words. El bez imi i el cheder horas. And another one. Shamo hiblasha imecha, shamo hibla yaladasha. And finally, we have two uh, verses from the book of Genesis. Vajome Ela, Mashnech, Vajome Yaakov, Vajome Lo Yaakov, Yamer Ot Shimcha, Ki Im Israel, Ki Sarisa Im Elohim, Ve Im Anashim Vatuha. So, what can be said? About this fragments. First, uh, about uh, the uh, strange numbers on the last song. So, so uh, uh, at the beginning of, of the second page, uh, I uh, quoted uh, a short information from uh, the Jewish Encyclopedia uh, one, uh, about one Palestinian authority, Rabbi Yosher of Levi, Palestinian Amar of the first half of the third century, counts only. 137 songs and, and not 150. 
Uh, and according to Gratz, this variance was due to the efforts to equalize the number of songs with that of the pentatelical periods according to the trainal cycle. So, the, uh, as it may, uh, it is very amazing uh, to see a rather old tradition of song numbering in a Cyrillic manuscript uh, of the uh, 16th century. Then, we, uh, as we already noticed, there is a lacuna in uh, the fifth uh, verse caused by Omer Tanekta and the corresponding Hebrew text is presented in italics, which has been skipped uh, by, uh, not by the original scribe, I suppose, but as a later um, uh, scribe. And uh, before we start our analysis, it will be purely um, Former, uh, we should note some phonetic, uh, phonetic value, the phonetic value of some Cyrillic characters used in the text. First, uh, the uh, letter fita uh, uh, should be pronounced exactly like fiat, uh, So we, we have the tof with written with fita. Uh, this letter with the same phonetical value as uh, for example, is in Shofar. Then we have uh, the letter uh, uh, Yat, uh, which um, have a, a, a double phonetical meaning when we account uh, the corresponding Hebrew vowels. It might be long A or uh, short A but no shwa. Uh, but it is interesting to note uh, that uh, in all of the cases we have yat in this text, uh, it, it is presented uh, in an accented syllable. So let's see. We have betzil tzlei, we have tegbehalel, then el heder, so if we, if we uh, consider this as a smichut construction, uh, like the el chadar horati, uh, so then we might expect uh, um, uh, that the last uh, syllable in the uh, word cheder could be accented. Then imecha, mashmecha, yamer. Uh, but uh, this same long A uh, may also be designated as uh, with the Cyrillic uh, letter um, yeast, like A, Beteika, and so on. You may see the uh, And then uh, the uh, Cyrillic uh, character uh, Glavoi. Um, it indicates both, uh, so had two correspondences in the Hebrew text. It is he, uh, like in hallelujah, uh, but also uh, g, uh, presented with, with gim, as uh, for example it is bigvu, bigvu rosaf, and after. Rosaf, where, where is it going to be? Rosaf. Big, 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 yeah, rosaf. No, okay. no, so well, it's one form, but it is presented as two different forms in, in the text I signed, but it's a single word. Uh, uh, like God law and so on. So it can be assumed that the scribe must have pronounced this like letter um, uh, Glavoy uh, as H or H in all the instances. Otherwise, he would have tried, as we can assume, uh, to orthographically distinguish between uh, or uh, on, the one, on the one side and G on the other. So in this pronunciation with uh, or uh, um, but not G, uh, is characteristic of the South American <coughs> regions of the world incorporated in the Grand, grand Dutch. So now we can see uh, that this Cyrillic text uh, indicates the original Jewish pronunciation. 
so our first point here. Um, uh, we know that uh, in Hebrew there is a difference between Shwa mobile and Shwa mute twistings. Uh, and our text follows uh, the Sephardi rules accepted also in modern Hebrew. So uh, uh, I have underlined uh, in, uh, uh, the uh, occurrences of Shwa mobile, uh, which is reflected uh, using the uh, uh, letter yes in the corresponding um, text. Like we have Bekor Sho, Beteka, Benele, Behinor, and we have uh, 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 this Shwa presented with yes only in prefixes. Be and be. In other instance, instances, we have a mute shva, uh, when, uh, which uh, uh, is transcribed uh, with Latin uh, uh, character e, but where there is no uh, uh, vowel at all as a corresponding Cyrillic text. You can see uh, the um, examples here. Uh, then, uh, as we know, comments uh, has a different uh, phonetical behavior in different words. It may indicate either a long uh, vowel A or short vowel O. And there is no way to know where uh, the comments uh, should be pronounced like A and where it should be pronounced like O, uh, except you know the language uh, or uh, at least the, uh, the text. So, and we have one instance when this uh, um, comet is pronounced like O, this comet's uh, in the uh, form Bekot Sho, the first O reflects exactly this, uh, this feature. <coughs> then, uh, the uh, uh, letter H is regularly reflected, uh, except in Ausland, uh, uh, Ausland, where there is no mapik in the vocalized uh, text. So we have Yahu, Hanshama, Tehalel, Horasi, Elohim, but when we have uh, the same uh, uh, letter H in Ausland, and where there is no mapit indicating that it should be pronounced in also uh, we have uh, no uh, character in the Slavonic text. So we have shammo and not shammo. We, we have hibla, mashmecha, onimara, shmecha, and so on. And uh, I also indicated um, two features which might be a reflection of uh, Jewish pronunciation, um, but which I cannot really understand or explain. Uh, it's between <coughs> four and five. Uh, in the vocalized text, we have in the in the um, second verse we have uh, a form good law, uh, which I cannot understand this shuruk in this case. Uh, why it is in this uh, form in the vocalized Hebrew text since we have the word Gadoy uh, but we see that the uh, scribe has written O and not U in the first syllable and also we have a little bit st strange transcription Shamo with the O uh, in the second syllable and not A uh, in spite of the fact that, as far as I know, this uh, form should be pronounced like shamma and not shamma. Uh, and uh, finally, we have uh, many cases which indicate some rules uh, named Beget Cafe. So, uh, uh, as we know, uh, six uh, consonants uh, which uh, should be pronounced uh, uh, like pl as plosive uh, 
um, uh, has a, a, have a different phonetical meaning and should be pronounced as theorems when uh, they occur uh, after a vowel. And we have uh, something very similar in our uh, Cyrillic transcription. First, we have uh, these uh, several cases of Kaf Rafa, which um, uh, is in invariantly um, pronounced uh, like Het and is indicated with Het. So you can see the examples. And this, um, the same phonetical meaning for Kafra Fe, uh, <coughs> uh, is a characteristic of Sephardi and Portuguese, but even more of Italic and Ashkenazi pronunciation. <coughs> then uh, we have uh, two uh, different transcriptions of Bet uh, Rafa, uh, which uh, is presented in our Cyrillic text by either V, just like vowel, uh, or B in unlocked. So we have big V rosa, krove, then V, Velav, Yakov, but, uh, uh, but we, we, we have on the other hands big V rosa, and not big V rosa, uh, like in uh, vocalized text here. We have veto and not veto, like in more vocalized text, and possibly that's in slay. But if, so uh, it, it must be said that this rule of uh, the should be applied also in the cases when the preceding um, form uh, has uh, a vowel in outline, in, in, in outline. so in these uh, instances the first letter of the uh, following word should be pronounced with the spirit. And we have several occurrences of taf rafe, which is reflected apparently by either t or s after a while. So we have the teka, the to, Ruya, but on the other hand, we have the Begur of Sa and Bez, or C, and so on. You can see. Uh, so uh, you, can, you, uh, you, you can see that uh, the rules of Beget Cafe applied in this early transcription uh, uh, do not uh, 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 coincide exactly with the uh, modern uh, rules. Accepted in <coughs> and uh, now uh, we can briefly comment on some dialectal features of the uh, original Jewish pronunciation. First of all, we have cough, which is pronounced like cough. <coughs> it, it, it is um, uh, presented with a k in the third text, like the k. <coughs> Uh, and it is characteristic of Sephardi in some Mizrahi or, uh, or Eastern uh, Jews, uh, uh, Jewish communities, but even more Portuguese, Italian, and Ashkenazi uh, Our second point Sade is pronounced as S and not as S, so we have that silent slay, which is characteristic of Sephardi in North Italian, but even more of Portuguese, South, and Central Italian. So, it seems to be an attempt to pronounce I, but only before A in Ausland. In Ausland. We have here Birki Ya and not Birki A, as would be absolutely, absolutely normal in a Cyrillic uh, text um, of the 15th in, uh, and 17th uh, uh, centuries. Uh, when uh, the uh, <coughs> South uh, Slavic tradition uh, of orthography was already accepted, but we have Birki Ya here, and the same we can see in Tru, in tru Ya, uh, but in other cases, uh, I is, is, is not reflected uh, in the text. If it is true, 
and, as, and, and there is indeed an attempt to pronounce Ein uh, uh, at least in uh, several uh, instances, uh, it uh, would be um, uh, characteristic of, of separate. Then, uh, all the geminated consonants are not reflected. We have a single uh, um, uh, consonant uh, letters in this rubric text. And finally, the most intriguing, intriguing uh, feature is uh, that the geminated J is uh, pronounced as J in our text. We have three times the same uh, form, Vajomer, instead of Vajomer, uh, which seems to be a French feature. Uh, if uh, we compare it with the pronunciation of such names uh, 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 as uh, Yakov, which is Jacques, uh, or, uh, or Johannes, which is Jean in French, uh, and which, is, uh, which differs uh, from uh, other traditions of pronunciation, like Juan, or Johannes, or Jan, or Giovanni, or something else. So, uh, five um, conclusions may be made from all of this. First, now we have uh, the sole example of the Hebrew text written in Syria, which is quite original, which is not a reflection of the translated text which reached the Slavia year, uh, Greek translations, or so on. So it's a new cultural and uh, cultural phenomenon uh, uh, which indicates that there was an attempt to learn some Hebrew uh, in East Slavia before uh, the uh, third quarter of the uh, 70 of the 16th century. Then uh, our second conclusion is that. Uh, in contrast to all uh, 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 these uh, philosophic uh, uh, treatises, um, we uh, finally have a liturgical text, I mean uh, the, last, uh, the last song, uh, which is a new uh, fact uh, in, in our field. Third, uh, this um, Cyrillic manual of Hebrew must have had uh, a direct Jewish source uh, since first mm, there is a very so rather unusual but but real uh, Jewish tradition of counting the last psalm as 147 uh, then we have a reflection on quite original Jewish pronunciation and uh, we can even see some dialectal features of this pronunciation so it, it, it is a, we have admit an original Jewish source. Then the more fourth conclusion. Uh, the dialectal features sometimes uh, um, coincide with that of Sephardi or, or uh, Central and South Italian, but we have a single feature which indicates uh, as far as we can understand. Um, the French tradition of pronunciation. So Maybe interesting to see uh, in an Islamic text uh, such a combination of, of the pronunciation rules. And finally, the use of uh, the Slavonic letter glagol, the uh, glagol, uh, which, uh, with, which uh, with the phonetic meaning of g and not g, uh, indicates that. Uh, this small uh, manual of Hebrew uh, must have originated somewhere within uh, the borders of the Great Dutch of Western. Thank you for your attention. Some remarks. First, I don't think that mm, the, the transcription of the uh, with with the Cyrillic Glagol necessarily indicates uh, the southwestern uh, region of the world. 
of second world war. The realization of Tsari as a superior is a realization of two Jewish uh, communities, uh, of the Ashkenazi uh, and of the Kurchaki. Pronunciation on all other communities uh, pronounced uh, Tsari like S or like So, but not S or Ch or any kind. Okay, so uh, in your second point, we have uh, we could have uh, actually pinpoint, uh, pinpointed uh, uh, the community uh, using this pronunciation. Uh, uh, your third point, uh, I don't think that somebody was trying to pronounce uh, your mind or anything possible. Similar to I think it's just a somewhat convention for using both. <coughs> uh, and uh, wow, well, uh, the point four is quite a remarkable, to be expected. And about uh, your uh, French feature, there is no, in fact, such a Jewish. These Hebrew texts and translations into Ruthenian and the Old Testament and a Hebrew Slavic glossary. So, first of all, I'd be interested to hear what that is, of what, how that works, because uh, I think we had a lot, because um, it's not clear what this is. It's, ne it's necessarily a way of learning Hebrew. I mean, it, it, it's a transliteration of texts. And so, that remains to be seen to my way of thinking what, the, what, what this is. Um, methodologically, I, I agree with what Dan was saying. I think it's very difficult to draw too many conclusions on the way he was pronounced from this kind of transliteration. Well, we're dependent on the ear and intelligence of the transliterator to get as close as possible to, to, to the original Hebrew. I don't think you can go too far in doing that. And my last comment, um, in terms of dialects, I think it might be easier, rather than looking at the consonants and at the vowels, the, the Hebrew dialect, the Hebrew speaking dialects in Eastern Europe are, are also very clearly delimited by the way they pronounce the vowels as much, if not more, than the way they pronounce the consonants. That would be interesting, particularly because in that region at that time you have more than one dialect of Hebrew running. So you have the Ashkenazi, and you're going to have um, Karaites, Kuchets, whatever, and you also have quite a, a, a connection between with the Jews of the Ottoman Empire in the late 16th century. So we don't know exactly what Jew or what Jewish community stood behind this. Anyway, but thanks very much indeed. Again, could you say a few words about the glossary? Okay. Uh, we will answer to all the questions together, I think. Yeah. Very, briefly, um, very interesting. Thank you. I believe uh, only, uh, I would say, uh, critical comments uh, on this paper are about dialectical uh, features, and I believe this is the only part that has to be revisited, and, and uh, uh, you will arrive to, to, I believe, much more sorts of uh, applications of, uh, of uh, 
of the grammar and the situation of the story. Um, what strikes me is that sometimes when we are dealing with uh, the Somalia, uh, the Somalia is prepared by somebody uh, just because a person wants to have a number of manuscripts uh, uh, put together. Sometimes this convolute, as they are called in the Islamic tradition, uh, manuscripts um, are randomly collected uh, by people later and then put uh, in, in, in uh, under one uh, and the same uh, binding. My question is this, whatever is the case, could you please tell us what else is there in this miscellaneous? In addition to things that you mentioned, the Old Testament fragments of Ruthenian, uh, and, and this uh, six pages of the text. Okay, uh, all the questions, or there is, please. Is it polygraphic context of, of these pages? Yeah, because, yeah, because uh, uh, Dr. Temchin has no answer to all the questions together. Okay, please. Two okay. brief remarks. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's many concerns uh, uh, the second verse of the first text, uh, where you found that uh, you find these inconsistencies in Big Urata, Big Urasa, Big Urasa and good, uh, good law instead of good law. Uh, I think we have to discern between uh, features different from the text you have before you, from the four lager you suggest that it was a four lager for this, uh, the author of this text, and from uh, if you can differentiate these features from grammatically impossible and probable forms, these forms are grammatically impossible and even probable. So, yeah, the question is whether you checked even, uh, you know, sometimes in vocalization there are different manuscripts. They are okay with many scrapers from different manuscripts and in, in vocalization. Uh, but even if they are not, a uh, person could remember this verse in this way because it's grammatically okay. Okay, so it's okay if I could just point out though that um, your uh, good law uh, written with the uh, the law, the law uh, that probably just reflects the Ukrainian development of all the closed syllable, the raised to e through u and u. That's not okay. Wait, wait, wait. It's not a wait, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> and, the la and the last, please, uh, use it, please. The la last, your the last. Yes, please. Vocalizations in that text, yes, he said, this is how our Jews say it. So no, you can answer all those questions. Okay. Question. This pronunciation is different from what is related. We don't find the skin of the pictures like sin or sour in the context. It's very important. Another example of the overall of the published version of the text that is this more bitter to the portion of the world where there is one. There is one, but it's not. So about the, the glossary and about the possibility uh, of uh, really teaching and learning Hebrew uh, in the Grand Duchy of Ruthenia. So I have no time to uh, say more about the manuscript uh, and uh, about the way uh, the material and uh, today we saw a small part of it is presented in this particular manuscript but there is an, uh, uh, an attempt to teach some Hebrew uh, because uh, so sometimes uh, uh, several verses in original Hebrew um, are first um, uh, translated form by form and then the scribe writes and now try to pronounce it as a whole and repeat all the text so we have some method, some uh, teaching uh, uh, methods trying to, to help people to pronounce uh, this text which is extremely <coughs> difficult for, for a person uh, uh, which has not been trained in this language of course and there are some different things there are, uh, there are some attempts to uh, ex not to explain, the, uh, there, there is no explanation uh, in this text. 
but to show, to demonstrate uh, uh, some features of grammar uh, in, within this glossary uh, and word formation and so on. They are not consistent, uh, but we can see the efforts of, the, of a hypothetical teacher uh, to present this material for uh, hypothetical learning. Okay, that's all. Uh, and about, about the context. Well, uh, it's a very large manuscript, and if I am going to, to just to name all the translations from Greek, uh, it, it would take a lot of time just to name all, all, all of them. The first text uh, is, is called Kormchi uh, Dusha. It's uh, Kormchi Dusha. It has nothing to do with the canonical uh, book of Kormchea and so on. Uh, it's uh, a skeptical uh, translation of Bulgarian origin. It, is, it has been not investigated in the scholarship as far as I know. There are uh, several um, other manuscript copies of the same uh, text. And our uh, Hebrew uh, manual is uh, presented after this first uh, rather large text. Is it the same scribe? Yes, absolutely by the same scribe. But we can see that the text we have now, it's not an original transcription of the Hebrew text, but rather a copy, which we hope, we hope because we have uh, one case of formula left on and so on, we may have some distortions and inconsistencies um, caused uh, uh, by uh, a subsequent uh, rewriting of the original text. So okay. it's not the original transcription. Thank you very much.